Okay, we'll start. All right, Jack, let's do it. Yeah. Welcome to the Life Uncharted podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been great here, to be here. Yeah, you've been here for about an hour, and our, our dogs have bonded. We actually have the same uh, Swiss mountain dogs. We've got do. a girl, I've got a boy. Mine's a little younger, and they're, um, uh, they're out somewhere out there exploring the exploring the great wilderness I, here around I your really house. believe this is a money-making opportunity for us. These are two good-looking dogs. But <laughs> I'll talk to my wife about that. That's a lot sure of work on your end, yeah, exactly. me being the guy with the male dog. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, easy. yeah, easy for you to say. We yeah. used to raise German Shepherds on my farm, and that was my responsibility. It's like feeding those puppies every morning, and it's pretty fun, but man, that's a lot of dog. Oh, feeding one every morning and getting her out a couple times a day and all that stuff that with juggling three kiddos and everything else, that's... But all we can handle. I think we're maxed. Right. Is she at the place now where she just needs like four or five miles in the morning to chill? Or? Oh, yeah. She yeah. Is, has a lot of energy. Yeah. A lot of energy. Baron's the same way. If I don't run him in the morning, uh, our office is miserable all day. Oh, you have to just, do it. Yeah, yeah. You got to do it. But it's great. You, sometimes it's a pain. But then once you get out there, like yesterday I was out there, uh, sun was going down, had the snowshoes on with what little snow we have left. Yep. But still, yep. you, you post hole in if you, if you don't have the snowshoes on where we are. And uh, had her out there. And it was so beautiful. And I was just very thankful that... You know, I wouldn't have gotten out. I would have done more work. Right. If the dog wasn't ready to go out, and so we went on a nice, you know, mile hike or whatever. It's forced it's exercise. Great. Yeah. I had a bulldog before, and he didn't do that for me. So okay. this is, this is much better. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get out there with them, and you're on the trail or whatever, it is, uh, it's a blast, and I'm very thankful that we that we have her. But you know, other times, like the, the barking in the middle of the night, sometimes if she's getting ready to, uh, you know, she needs to, if she needs to go out or whatever. Then that's... <laughs> does she have the big baru? Like, have you seen that yet? Mm-hmm. Which it, Baron has this like thing oh. that will shake the windows in this house. No. And because this house is all windows, a tree blows. And about 2 a.m., he just, he thinks somebody's attacking. And, oh, uh, it's scary. But no, nobody's no. breaking in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, out here, you'd have to get specifically targeted at. That's it's true. There's a lot of nice empty houses to drive by to get to this one. So yeah. I think we're good. But, there you go. Uh, yeah, I get it. Well, so I always start by asking people to introduce themselves because I don't want to say it wrong. I mean, I know your background, but I would prefer if you would just tell people Absolutely. who Jack Hart is. All right. Yep. So, uh, well, I'm a, a new author, I guess you'd say, but I grew up always wanting to write. And I grew up also always wanting to serve my country in uniform as a Navy SEAL. I found out what they were very early in life at mm-hmm. age seven and just kind of kept my eye on that goal from age seven up until I went in. And um, I, I think it, that was because... My grandfather was killed in World War II, so I grew up with his uh, his medals, his old the silk maps they used to give aviators back then. He flew the, the Corsair, which was that gull wing blue uh, plane that the wings would yeah. fold up on. There was that old TV show, Black Sheep Squadron, back in the 70s, early 80s with Robert Conrad. So I was watching that um, and grew up with the pictures of his plane and his squadron and his wings and all that. So I always knew I wanted to go in the military, but then I found out what SEALs were, and I was like, okay. I'm in. So that's a very common theme I hear a lot of times. Is the military thing is a very generational family thing, right? I mean, of the guys you served with, were a lot of them did their dads or grandpas serve, or was it a mix? Or a mix, yeah, really, really came, especially in the SEAL teams. I mean, I, that's my only experience, really. Uh, and we had people from all different backgrounds. So you had people from uh, from inner city. You had guys from you know Appalachia that had never seen the Pacific Ocean before. You had enlisted guys that were road scholars. You know, it was right. like, incredible. So you had this all this diversity coming into these small teams. And I think that's really what let us be uh, successful downrange. Is you have all those different backgrounds coming together, and everybody's bringing that experience to right. now this this common problem set. So I think that made us a lot stronger downrange. But it was, yeah, it's hard to draw any sort of uh, parallels or comparison or anything other than people just wanting to test themselves and serve their country. So that was one of the questions I was going to ask you is like, what makes a great SEAL? So from your perspective or your team, like, are these guys that, I remember, you know, I've been to Iraq a bunch of times and it was always described as like pro athletes with surgeon brains kind of. (laughs) <laughs> which well, may or may not be true, yeah, but that's how that's I was, it. that's how I was, you know, like it was presented to me. But yeah. like from your perspective, is there one commonality among, among all your guys? Well, there's a few, there's a few, but there's one that kind of is the umbrella over all the others. And of course it's that, that drive, that determination, that never quit attitude that we're trying to find in buds. Uh, and that's why we typically have that 80% attrition rate there. Cause we do a pretty good job of ferreting out people that aren't there for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we had to make up a word for what we were looking for because it didn't exist. And that word was team ability. So we were looking for that person that could operate as part of this team. And uh, you know, 
that's what we're looking for in buzz. That's why every, you will go everywhere with a swim buddy. Uh, that's why you're under those boats together as a team. That's why you're lifting those logs together as a team. Mm-hmm. And that's why you get punished <laughs> as, a team as a team when you uh, when you don't perform uh, or some member of the team doesn't perform. Have you read that book, uh, Stealing Fire? I have not, no. They talk a lot about that. Is I think they were right. calling it like a mind meld, but the whole team kind of just getting in unison and working together when there was a mission, that was the differentiator. Yep, so interesting right that you said that too. Yep. And so when, when I went through, it was, you know, if you were off by one second on your run or your swim, um, you were out. You had to you had to get one more chance or maybe two, whatever, to do it again. Um, and then if you passed, then okay, great. One second but off of off of your, your other time. time or like a time that they've pre Ah, well, that's a good question. So on the runs and the, and the swims, mm-hmm. uh, there's certain times per um, uh, per phase that you have to hit. Right. Now for the obstacle course, uh, you you have times per phase, but then also you have to beat your previous time on that particular evolution, which is a great workout, by the way. That obstacle course is awesome. And I, I put it into the book because it was, so, it was yep. so, it's such a great workout. If you only have 10 minutes to do a workout, hitting that thing is awesome. And then you can, as you get better, or you don't have instructors breathing down your neck, then you put on the body armor and do it in body armor, or you run it backwards or, mm-hmm. or, um, or whatever else. But, um, but yeah, it's really that, that, uh, that team ability, that mindset of being part of that team and also yeah, obviously having that drive, determination, that mental fortitude um, that, uh, that we're looking for. But by the time things evolved after, uh, you know, I don't know what time frame, but into 2000 sometime, uh, it became like, hey, if this guy has this team ability thing we're looking for, do we really care that he's off by one second right. on, this, on this swim? Well, I was going to say, some no. guys got to be bigger and probably stronger. Like, they can lift more. Some guys are fat. It's like a football team, right? You have wide receivers exactly. and offensive linemen. Exactly. Some guys, sometimes you just need that huge dude to lift something heavy. Right, right. Um, and uh, so so things evolved a little bit, bit, I think, became a little more subjective. And then as I was um, as I was leaving the military, I went to Bud's as the operations officer, which uh, for those listening, it's like a, uh, a COO of a company. So okay. running day-to-day operations. So about 800 students, 200 staff, um, and the commanding officer had brought in or wanted to kind of move things forward because when he got there and when I showed up about the same time, we still had like stacks of papers on every single student. So if you failed, let's say your room inspection because there was sand in it, like that's in your file. Like, so what does that tell me about the guy? Like, the, what is that? How do we use that bit of information to figure out if this is the guy we want to be on a SEAL team with one day. Uh, so and is that important information? That, not really. No? <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like an attention to detail thing? or it's... It is, but I mean, who knows? Sometimes like when I was there, instructors would come in and you'd have a great room and they'd dump, some sand, dump a bunch of sand on the floor and say, hit the surf. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, one, it's a data point maybe, you know. But, right. uh, but So how do you collate that data? How do you, how do you use that data to figure out uh, if this guy is somebody that you want to have in a SEAL team? So they started to modernize it right as I was leaving and get everything up in a, a cloud and have everybody be, have, you know, when, when you do triathlons or whatever, have mm-hmm. a little band that tracks your times and all these different things and, um, and really use technology to figure out is this person is the whole the, the whole person right. someone we want to have on the team? Not just oh, he failed to swim by two seconds, that guy's out. He did it twice in a row. We can't have that kind of team. Well, he might be the best team player you've ever had, or maybe uh, you know whatever. He stumbled. There, yeah, yeah. But he could be the best seal ever. Right. Uh, but he's off by two seconds. So anyway, it became a little more subjective as we went along. How long has it been since you went through buds? Uh, I went through ninety-seven. Ninety-seven. So it's been a couple years. How old were you then? <laughs> yeah, uh, I was twenty-two. 22. Yeah. Is that the is that the right age? Young, tw- early 20s. Yeah, you know, we had guys there that were 18. We had guys, uh, a few guys older, but I think around 20, 21 ish might be about the uh, the average age. I'm not sure, but uh, that seems like it anyway. Just uh, from from having been around it uh, as long as I have. You have, you have guys that are you know a couple of years into college that decide they want to they want to come in. They don't mm-hmm. want to finish. Or you have guys that finish college and they want to come in. And you have guys that are just waiting to graduate high school so they can jump into boot camp and then get get into buds. Right. Um, and then you have guys that are coming from the private sector that have spent a few years in, in private industry and you know, they're 27, 28 years old, maybe they get a waiver for buds to come in and so they're bringing that experience with them. So you have a really diverse wow. set of backgrounds there. So obviously SEAL teams have become a pretty um, interesting thing to our culture the last decade or whatever. Mm-hmm. What do you think the biggest misconception is? Like when you, what's the biggest like, uh, like pet peeve when you see it Presented. I don't have a pet peeve, but um, you know you can definitely get in trouble by believing your own press. 
Mm. Uh, we've got some pretty good press over there. There's a few little things here and there, but for the most part, um, there's been some high profile missions that have been highly publicized that have really put SEALs in the limelight. And even before that, there was uh, a lot of recruiting efforts that were trying to get SEALs in the limelight because uh, it's marketing. It's what well, it's marketing, and you know, the Department of Defense was like, hey, you know, we're in this this long term war. And we need more SEALs. We need more special operations guys. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, uh, the senior officers get together and figure out how to do that. And some of them decided that uh, we should have, a, have active duty SEALs be in a movie. And right. so, uh, uh, you know, Active Valor came out. So that's the, re the result of that. And then there was a lot of controversy within the teams then about, about that. Was that. Is that too much? Was that too much spotlight? Uh, then books started coming out. Um, some approved, some not. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of became an issue in the teams and uh, people thought, some people thought hey it's too much and some people thought hey we're well we're recruiting but then the question is well are we recruiting the right people for the right reasons or right. Are we recruiting people that want to be in movies yeah. yeah so I mean there's a lot of factors there and luckily I didn't have to deal with any of that I was just there to do the job um, to take my guys down range and my last deployment to Iraq was the one where I would tactically lead guys on the battlefield for the last time because I'd made enough rank I came in enlisted mm -hmm. uh, then I became an officer and that last deployment to, the, to Iraq was my troop commander slot. So as a lieutenant commander, pretty much from there on out, you, know, you move up, you do a staff job, and then you come back as a CO. But really, in today's world, as a commanding officer, you're not you're not leading guys from the front anymore. You're back in the tactical operations center, and we need guys doing that. That's for yep. sure. But for me, I wanted to lead guys from the front. I wanted to be there, kicking doors with them, tactically leading them on the battlefield. And once that time was passed, it was very clear to me that it was time to to move on and <laughs> take care of the family. Man, amazing that. You have those experiences, and now you're in Park City with a family and a That's dog, it. and it's it's got to be kind of a weird thing to wake up to sometimes. Just yeah, no, I love it. It was uh, it was never. I never had a question. Hey, is this is this the right time for me to get out? And a lot of guys struggle with that. A lot of mm. guys just like being like we have around here. We have a lot of Olympic athletes that when that time is over in their life, yeah, a lot of them kind of figure out what, what's their transition. What are they going to do? Same thing, professional athletes. Yeah, I think of Michael Jordan do? or Brett Favre or any of those guys. Yeah, it's, what are they going to do? If that's next? your whole identity. Mm -hmm. what's next and it doesn't matter if it's an individual sport like some of the ones around here skiing or whatever because it's still a team mm -hmm. you're still part of the team uh, but you've been so focused on a mission for so long uh, and just like in the SEAL teams you're focused on that mission at hand that task at hand and when you decide to get out a lot of people will second guess themselves did I make the right decision should I have stayed in and it's, it's tough for guys especially as they move on out and struggle with new businesses or being part of a new corporate culture that's not what they were used to in the SEAL teams right um, but for me I was very lucky and I think I'm a, a little bit of a, a little bit different than, than most people's because I knew exactly what I wanted to get into uh, I wanted to write mm -hmm. and I jumped right into that 100% all in and I uh, got very lucky and, and made it happen but I also thought it was a good move to make a physical and psychological break with the Navy. So sure. that's why we left San Diego and, and came out here and wanted to raise our kids in a ski town surrounded by all this beauty. Um, I mean, essentially, in San Diego, we lived in Coronado on the beach, but never went to it. Right. Uh, right. Dogs were dragging sand, kids, kids dragging sand, <laughs> sort of total chaos all the time. And uh, so we come here and now we drag in snow and dirt, you know, but, uh, but there's no getting around that. Yep. You, you, yep. No, no choice in the matter so uh, so we love it out here absolutely love it it was the right move for us and such a great uh, place yeah absolutely love Park City we're yeah. never leaving so before I get into the book a couple more questions about your previous life you had mentioned some guys have there's been some highly publicized missions and whatnot you know I've read a lot of like pe like people get upset when guys take credit for certain things you know there's been some guys you write fiction but guys are reaccounting basically missions that whether they did or didn't do it. What's your take on that? Is that, are you like, whatever, that's fine. Or is that, is that a bummer to see? Or how do you, how do you process that? Yeah. So as I was getting out, you know, these things were being talked about and I'm going to, especially at being at a training command, um, where you're mentoring through the next generation of SEALs, it was, it was talked about quite a bit because right. it was right at that tipping point, uh, where these books started to come out, the movie had come out and it was talked about quite a bit. Right. And you know, for me, and it was talked about a lot in a negative way. Uh, by the people, the powers that, that be at the time. And, you know, for me, it there's a history in this country and a history worldwide of people getting out and writing about their life experience in sure. the military. And I read everything I possibly could uh, before I came in the military. And in the 80s, like, you know, there was no internet, obviously, back then. You, know, you couldn't just Google Navy SEAL and see what popped up. So um, a lot of things, uh, well, 
uh, Tom Clancy, you had a character, John Clark, who was a Navy SEAL, so in the fictional realm. Mm -hmm. David Morrell mentioned them in a book called Brotherhood of the Rose. Uh, Clive Cluster mentioned them in Raise the Titanic. But uh, there were a few nonfiction books as well, and they started to uh, come out, you know, I think in the late 80s and then early 90s, Richard Marcinko's book came out, uh, Jim Patches Watson's book came out, and there was a bunch of, of books about Navy SEALs, mostly in Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, at that time. But, you know, there's uh, Grant has his memoirs from the Civil War. Right. Uh, there, right. Are, True. Uh, there are so many examples in this country and worldwide of people getting out and talking about their experience. And it becomes a first-person account. Not necessarily, it shouldn't be the end-all, be-all. This is, I want to set the record straight on this mission or on this campaign or whatever it is. It should be looked at as that person's perspective mm. on it. So it's part of the, the greater collective now that can be used as a first-person account when someone goes and collects all these things and writes their history right of what on. happened. So I look at it in those terms. It can be therapeutic for these guys to do that, to share their experience. It can mentor the next generation. I can inspire the next generation to join the military. And I think that kids today need heroes. They need yeah. uh, people to look up to. And I would much rather have my kids reading one of the books written by any of the special operations guys that have gotten out than, let's say, a book on the Kardashians or something. <laughs> Nothing against the Kardashians. But Amen. I would just <laughs> rather you know, my kids be reading about these people that yeah. uh, joined the military to serve their country and uh, were part of uh, something bigger than themselves. And hopefully that's how a lot of these books come across, is that this, this is one person's account of their experience. And that's so, how it should be taken. Who are some of your favorites or what are some of your favorite books like if somebody's listening and like I want to get my kids into that or I'm interested yeah so if it's for kids it's different but my uh, you know my all-time favorite and most gifted book is Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer and it was written in 1968 and essentially it's almost an anti-war book but it's historical fiction and follows two guys two leaders from before right before World War One okay. up until Vietnam and one guy is prior enlisted, gets a battlefield commission in World War I. The other guy is a staff officer, starts as an officer, and really never sees combat firsthand the way the prior enlisted guy does. Mm -hmm. And you follow their parallel careers or experience up until Vietnam. And uh, I write, write my guys a letter, and I put it in the front of the novel, and I'd write a, another letter and put it in the back. And they'd have to wait till they finished it, to get to the one in the back, and that one in the back is my take on what they had just read. So this is required um, reading for people you've... Well, for my uh, my senior, mostly I gave it to my uh, senior enlisted leaders and my junior officers. Interesting. Um, so I gifted it to them, and now I gift it to people in business now that I'm on, on the outside here. It's still my most most gifted book, but uh, yeah, fascinating read. It's amazing, cool. historical fiction. Um, and then, of course, uh, Atlas Shrugs, Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, and uh, Winds of War and Warm Remembrance by Herman Woke, which are also historical fiction. Very cool. So when did you start writing? Was it, was it after? Were you writing during? Was this something you did when you were kind of in some tent in Iraq somewhere? No, no I was solely focused on the, on the task at hand. I knew I would eventually do it, and I've been a lifelong reader. My mom was a librarian, so that's what I found about SEALs. We saw, I was, back in the day, my, I was the remote control, and during football games on Sundays, there was usually a war movie playing opposite football. And so when it was commercial, <laughs> my dad would look at his watch and start the timer. And I had two minutes to go flip the channel, watch whatever war movie was playing, and then flip it back for football until the next commercial. So I didn't really care about football, but I cared about that war movie. And one wow. of them was The Frogman, which is an old black and white movie. And you know, I caught two minute snippets of it uh, throughout that game. But I asked my dad, hey, who are these guys? And he said, those are frogmen. And I said, what's a, what's a frogman? And he said, ask your mother. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I asked my mom. He just wanted me to stop pestering him. And uh, we went down to the local library, did some, some research, and found out about underwater demolition teams and learned about, uh, about SEALs and found out that well, the takeaway from that research was, hey, these are some of the, the toughest uh, special operations warriors uh, that we have in our, in our arsenal. Mm -hmm. And the training, some of the toughest ever designed by a modern military. So uh, they had me. From, uh, from the get-go. So is that the attraction for you? Is just that this is the top and this is the, the pinnacle and I'm going to, that's who I am and I want to yep. be there? Exactly, exactly. I just kept, uh, yeah, kept focused on it for all those, uh, all those years. Or is it, was there ever a point where it didn't feel worth it or you were going through the process and you're like, I made them in over my head or you're just <laughs> like, this is... No, I mean, when you're going through buzz, particularly in, in Hell Week, you know, it's miserable. And yeah. It's, it's, 
And how we think, reason. is it true they just keep you up for days on end? Yeah, like so you start, uh, <laughs> you wake up Sunday morning and then you, uh, it starts, you know, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, some time frame, they try to surprise you. And then it finishes on, on Friday, Friday afternoon. And in there you'll get a couple hours of sleep. It's in a tent on the beach with cots on it. Uh, on like I think it's Wednesday and Thursday you get two hours hmm. so if you go in and fall right asleep then you get those two hours if you're in medical for some reason because you're hurt and they're checking you out to make sure you're okay and you get you come back for the last hour and you fall asleep right away then you get that hour oh. uh, or maybe you lie there I think most people f fall asleep pretty dang quick when you hit that but I wish they didn't give us those two hours because the worst part of Hell Week was waking up for I'm those sure. two hours of sleep you go in there and it's disgusting because everybody's you know, you're sweating and whatever else because you've been running around, you're breathing, and it's nasty and uh, it's just all humid and gross. And then it seems like a second later, they're waking you up, throwing flash crashes in, coming in again with the, the you know, what, what people would know as an M60, whatever, with, a, with the blanks firing over your head, and you're <laughs> right into the surf zone again. So you're linking arms and you're walking into that Pacific Ocean. And of course, they've, they've uh, you've let you sleep kind of right before uh, sunset. So as you go back in, that sun's sinking down and it's getting dark and you know the next the next group of instructors are coming in or maybe they are the next group that come in and wake you up i can't remember but um it's miserable and that was the worst part is going back in after those couple hours that they give you on wednesday and is that Thursday. the most prolific moment you remember from that week is like that moment or are there any other good stories you can share i think people are always fascinated in a yeah. first-hand perspective of this no i remember all the uh team building exercises and uh for those listening, I just did air quotes on team building exercises. <laughs> but uh, yeah, super, I mean, now looking back, they're fun. But uh, at the time, they weren't. But it pays to be a winner. That's one of the, the terms that they, they talk about in Buds. So it pays to be a winner. So if you're doing a race against all the other boat crews and you're paddling out through the surf zone and then racing back in. So you get out through the surf zone, you dump your boat over, uh, you get it back, turn it back over, you jump back in and paddle back in and, and surf a wave in to the beach. And if you do that first, you get like, Two minutes to rest, like which doesn't sound like much, but you know, like, yeah, we won. But yeah, if you're at 180 beats per minute, you're uh, and you uh, just sit there for two minutes and, right. wait and watch the, you know, and the other watch the other people finish up right. uh, or whatever. So it uh, it pays to be a winner. So those types of things, those races, I remember doing those. And I started in boat crew three because it's all done by height because you have these boats on your head, so you have to have people of similar heights. And I started, I think, in boat crew three by the time Hell Week started, and within. Well, the first few hours I was in boat crew one because so many people had quit. So I stayed with boat crew one, which are the big guys. And I think I was the smallest guy. How many people are in a boat? Uh, you have like I think three on the sides and then a boat crew leader. So, you know, like seven. seven so you're the saying like you lost 10 or 12 people that quick. Oh, yeah. You, they started <laughs> quitting droves as soon as that hell week starts for whatever really? reason. I think you build it up in your mind so much. And then you think not just to the next evolution or the next meal. You think, oh, man, I can't do five full days of this because this right. is miserable. And so... Really, you get a lot that Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday. By by Wednesday, I think you're pretty much if you're in by Wednesday, you're kind of a zombie at that point. And uh, you know, instead of doing things for time, now you're doing these these team building type exercises where they're just keeping you up and keeping you moving. You run down to oh, essentially almost down to Tijuana with these boats on your head, and then you go to the Tijuana mud flats, <sighs> and then you do races in the like weird races down there where you're in this mud which is essentially sewage it's disgusting there are all sorts of infections that people get out of it but uh but you race each other in these mud flats and so you're slipping and sliding all over the place it's totally disgusting um and then uh so i remember all those all the, all the team building stuff from hell week is what i remember the most and i look back on those fondly but at the time it was miserable but isn't that the truth like Pretty much anyway. we were just talking <laughs> about like the hunt like you know i did just did this moose hunt and it was 10 days, 130 miles on foot, carrying everything in my back, 15 below, snowing. It was miserable. Yeah. But now looking back on it, it's like my favorite memory ever. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. There's exactly. something weird about that in the human mind. Yeah. That like, oh, yeah. The more it hurts. Exactly. Yeah, my first elk was, uh, I forget how far it was, like a mile, but we had to go back to where we could get horses to pick up, uh, oh, pick yeah. up the elk. So I think it was four times back and forth to, to bring this thing out. And that was oh. some of the hardest things I've ever done. Even even when I think about buds and think about things downrange, uh, that was tough. Like, not to get into hunting too much, but the density of, like, a hind quarter of, of an animal that big and how, like, floppy kind of it is. Yeah. It's not like a log. Right. 
it's, it's a different kind of weight. Yeah, yeah, it's like this blob of 150 pounds yeah. that just is impossible to carry well. It's a different deal. <laughs> yeah, and a mile? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's why I like the, the workouts that we do. We were talking about earlier with uh, our friends here in, in Park City because it's all, I mean, it's like CrossFit on steroids mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. being it, but it definitely prepares you better for going to the backcountry and uh, carrying things that aren't uh, weighted, just right. like, uh, you know, a perfect kettlebell or, you know, Olympic lift or whatever. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Was there ever a time when you were serving overseas that was as difficult as Buds? Or does that kind of, if you can do that, you can do anything? So looking back, Buds is one of the easiest things that you do in the SEAL teams. Oh, it Your is. Your responsibility is to show up at the right place at the right time with the right gear and not quit. That's it. Hmm. Yeah, there's some time devolutions that you have to you have to make, but any average high school athlete can make it through physically. It's all mental, all mental. And there's some safety things you have to do with weapons and demolition and that sort of sure. thing. But really, that's it. That's your responsibility. And it's your responsibility, essentially, to get yourself through and be a good team player. That's it. Very simple. Hence the basic and basic underwater demolition seal training. Right. Um, once you get to the team and once you get downrange, particularly after September 11th, completely different dynamic. Now you have your decisions you make um, have dire consequences and you know guys lives hang in the balance uh, mission success hangs in the balance mm -hmm. and there are a lot of factors out there that you can't control um, you know there's IEDs there's vehicles getting to and from the target there's aircraft there's weather there's all these things that you can't control that all need to be factored in right. uh, to your decisions in a very dynamic environment so um, so totally different totally different deal mm. uh, I never I never was like oh you know what? I went through buds, so I can handle this. No. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you and you said '97 is when you went through. Yeah. So after September 11th, what was the what was the change? Was yeah. it? I, I'm not saying it was casual, but was there like a tightening down of everything after that, or what? Huge, what was the transition like? Huge change. So we all thought we were going to get to our teams after buds and. We would get these pagers, and they'd open these golden Connex boxes, and we got this awesome gear. And we'd be like <laughs> at the bar having drinks, and all of a sudden the pagers James would Bond. go off. Yeah, yeah. we'd go off, and zip off, and you know, do our mission, and, and come back. And what really happens is that you get to your SEAL team, and you show up, and you're a new guy. And uh, they're like, "All right, new guy, uh, clean that bathroom, paint that wall, change that light bulb, do new guy stuff." Mm -hmm. And uh, you're like, what, "What about the secret missions? When, when do I? When does that happen?" And uh, it didn't didn't really happen. You know, we'd had then there'd been flashpoints since Vietnam, but we hadn't been in sustained combat operations since Vietnam. Um, we'd had Grenada, we'd had Desert One, you know, because that's the army, but um, we had Panama, we had Mogadishu. So we had these little flashpoints, but not sustained combat operations. After September 11th, then things changed. And I'm curious how it is for people coming in today, because now they're coming into it, they know what they're getting, getting into. We hoped that we'd go downrange. That's why you joined the SEAL teams in the first place to go right. and do the job. Um, but it was a it was different, particularly for officers. Officers would do like two platoons, and then they'd go to a staff job, and they might never deploy again. Hmm. Uh, now it's constant deployments since September 11th, and you know for the most part that you're going downrange. You need to go get after it. So yeah, definite mindset shift, definite shift as far as gear um, acquisition and uh, how you're using that gear. So uh, and tactics, techniques, procedures morphed because what we've really been doing is use tactics that worked in the jungle in Vietnam and we plopped those tactics down in urban environments for training. Got we it. plopped them down in the desert, in the mountains, but we've done the same thing. And then after September 11th, it became very evident that, hey, those techniques, um, well, one gear, equipment, night vision, lasers, all that stuff has evolved, but things that work in the jungle don't necessarily work uh, as well, maybe in environments like, like this. Black Hawk Down. Or, or, yeah. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, there was definitely a shift, and not just for the guys operating, but for the families. So the families were used to the, their spouse going away and going, maybe you went to the Philippines for a few months, or you went to Thailand, or, or whatever else you went. Sometimes you go to Europe, um, and then you'd come home, and there was no war. Uh, there was always that, kind of that in the back of your mind, like, hey, something could happen, but it would probably be a one-off, because our collective experience had been Mogadishu, Panama, Grenada, that sort right. of thing. Um, and most of the Vietnam guys had, had, or had moved on by, uh, by that point. Um, so the families now, after September 11th, are in it as well. So you're in it really as a team, and right. you're figuring it out together. Um, so now you're coming into it, and it's kind of, I won't say it's been figured out, but you, you know what you're doing. But at the it's beginning, knowledge base, right yeah. after September 11th, Families didn't know what to do. You know what was going on. Uh, you know we didn't really know what we were doing yet. Uh, it took a while to to figure out what we were doing and get good at it. How soon after that were you deployed overseas? Did that happen right away? I was already deployed. I was, it was two two months into my second deployment. Okay. When September 11th happened, and we were in Guam, and then a uh, 
podcast. We got started, got the phone call started. We didn't have TVs in our rooms at the time. It was barracks. I was enlisted. And uh, phones start ringing up and down the hallway. Uh, people start knocking on doors. And we go out into the hallway and we all went downstairs into the basement of the barracks and there was a TV down there. So we watched the, the Twin Towers fall on TV together. What was the um, emotion in the room for you guys? It was like we thought we were gonna go like the next day we were gonna be off. Fired um, up? Oh, well, Nervous? No, it was more like, like it was more like, you know, just a quiet kind of a, a resolute uh, commitment, like, hey we're this is real. This is what we came in to do. Mm-hmm. And let's go get after it. Let's do it. And uh, and we, were, we didn't, you know, at least nobody knew. It took a few days to, well, it took a couple of weeks to figure things out. Right. But uh, fairly soon thereafter, we were in plans to the Middle East. And we thought we were going to go right to Afghanistan. Ended up that Team 3 went in. And there's some there's histories written about all that. But they were already deployed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were in, uh, they were already over there. And they went to Afghanistan. And we took over their mission, which was shipboardings uh, in the North Arabian Gulf. Which, before September 11th, everybody wanted to do those. Because that was the only game in town. After September 11th, everybody wanted to go to Afghanistan. So mm. um, I found myself in Afghanistan not too, uh, not too far after that. But initially, it was uh, taken over for Team 3 doing the ship boardings. Wow. And were there any high-profile situations you were a part of that you can talk about? or uh, Nothing that, like... I mean, there's a few, couple of things that made the news, but nothing that anybody would remember. So, no. Do you guys operate a, still... There's A majority of your work is still pretty secretive, right? Uh, I mean, there's... Or, it's so routine. I wouldn't say... It, it's... it's it's hard. You don't want to say routine because every mission is different. Every mission needs to be looked at. But it's almost like, you know, like space shuttle. You know, mm-hmm. Everybody from our generation remembers when the space shuttle blew up. Yep. And people use that word routine over and over again. People got got used to it. So um, it's almost routine for us as a country now to turn on the news and see, oh, there's stuff going on in Iraq. There's still stuff. Are we still there? There's stuff in Afghanistan. Oh, I think we're still there. What's it? What's going on in Yemen? We're, we're pulling troops. Do we have troops there? Like, that sort of thing. It's just mm-hmm. become so natural for people to turn on the news and have it be background noise that it's not like it was right after September 11th when we were glued to that TV to figure out what was going on. Right. Um, so yeah, there's guys right now that are probably, um, depending on what time it is here, either getting ready to go or coming back from a mission every that we'll never hear about. And you know they're out there and they're taking helos in, they're taking Hilux trucks in, they're taking Humvees in, whatever it is, and things can go wrong on any of those missions. Helos can get shot down, they can crash, they can hit an IED going to target, they can go into a house on target and it could be wired to, to blow up. Mm-hmm. So it could be a yeah, house born IED. Um, so that could happen on any one of these missions. And you know we don't know about it because we're not following and it's not gonna make the news unless something bad happens. Man, I had, you know, in, in my trips overseas, a general once told me like, there are attacks on our home soil. Like his, he, he said every day that we never hear about. I don't know if that's the frequency, but it does seem like there's, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I get frustrated by people that are like, we need to, they're reacting to what they see in the news because it's maybe 5% of the whole story. Right. right? Like, oh, we need to get out of there. We need to do this, we need to do that. But it's like, there's so much going on underneath and there's so much nuance to it all that I have just a ton of respect and trust I'd say a lot of people don't trust the government per se anymore, but seeing what I've seen, it's like, thank God those people are over there thinking about that and yeah. doing those things because the whole world would be different if that wasn't already in place and operating. Well, hopefully they're learning. So I look at it so that our strategic level leaders, um, they need to be learning and adapting just like we are on the battlefield. So we're constantly learning. The enemy's constantly learning, and it's a game of, of constant adaptation. And whoever does that faster than their opponent usually ends up on top and right. the enemy is not part of a big bureaucracy so particularly in the you know in my experience from let's say 2001 up to you know 2012 whatever they were very good at adapting they were very good at figuring out what they wanted to get out of a mission and then working backwards mm-hmm. from there so they worked the marketing piece so what are they what are they selling and then they'd work back from right. that and figure out how to get it uh, where we did the opposite essentially and then we were slow to be able to respond to accusations from the enemy or something maybe the enemy even planned because they figured out hey if we do something and blame it on the Americans by the time they figure out how to respond with a press release no one's going to believe it There's, anyway yep. and we move on to something else yeah. exactly so they learned how to harness that uh, they were good at the PR campaign much better than than we we ever were but point being I expect our leaders to be as good at adapting to things at the strategic level mm-hmm. as we were at the tactical level. And if we made some of the mistakes that they did strategically at the tactical level, we would be fired, kicked out of country, and uh, maybe kicked out of the military. Um, but at the strategic level, we trust our senior level leaders to make good decisions. Right. Um, and we have to, 
because we're going in there to, to do the mission. We can't be second guessing that. Um, but we also we have to trust that they do make those good strategic level decisions for us and for the country. And there's a few times where they, they didn't and, they, uh, and we paid a powerful price for that at the tactical level. So that's a great segue into your, into your book, The Terminal List. <laughs> there, there are some things that it was very therapeutic to write that book, even though it's a, uh, it's a story that's complete fiction. Uh, the emotions uh, that the protagonist, James Reese, feels are things that I felt over the last 20 years somewhere. Uh, some of them frustrations with senior level strategic leaders, and then uh, some of it that, uh, you know, bringing the tactics and techniques that worked against us downrange to home soil. So at its base, it's really a story of revenge without constraint. But at another level, it's about a guy that questions and really abandons everything he's been fighting for for most of his life and becomes the terrorist that he'd been fighting, becomes the insurgent that he's been fighting uh, and adapts their tactics, their techniques and uses them Against on home them. soil. Uh, then at another level, if you think of it even, <laughs> even deeper, it's really about somebody that brings the wars home from Iraq and Afghanistan to people that have never been downrange, that have been sending men and women from their comfortable offices in Northern Virginia and DC uh, downrange, and he brings the war home to them. So it's kind of, it has those three different levels there. You know, I, I think he was in high school. I went to a movie, and I can't remember the name of the movie. Um, Will Smith was in it, and it, basically it was like, they could zoom in a satellite from space and watch him running across the roof, right? Like there was all this technology. I can't remember what the... I forget the name of it, but I remember the one you're talking about. But the book reminded me of that because even though you watch these fictional things, I always kind of feel like there's a level of truth or reality in these. I just remember watching that and whoever the girl I was dating at the time, she was like, can they do that? And I remember thinking like, I don't know. Maybe they can. (laughs) I mean, now I've been in... You know, I remember the first time we went and saw the U-2 spy planes at a base in the Middle East, and they'd only let us look at one side of the plane. Huh. And they're like, the other side's classified, you can't go over there, can't look at what's up. Not that I would even know what I right. see, yeah, yeah. but I'm like, well, what does this do? And they're like, well, we can read a license plate from space with this camera. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what's on the other side? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Right. Like, so when I'm reading your book, so much of me was like, I, I'll just give this as an example. You've got a powerful female politician <laughs> that appears one way, that in the other way is, is doing some things that are very self-serving. And I'm trying not to give the book away, yeah, no. but I could very easily point to a very powerful female politician <laughs> in this world yeah. who may or may not have run for president, right. who I've, in my 40 trips to the Middle East, heard a lot of crazy stories about, and I just go, <laughs> was that the uh, inspiration for that person, <laughs> or like? It's quite possible, if you look at when I wrote the novel, <laughs> and uh, what was going on uh, politically at the time, right. uh, there, you're, that character may or may not have been uh, inspired by an actual <laughs> person. But uh, there's a few people, and that's why it's, I think it's resonating with people, is because it, it, it does seem like it's real, because, and it's, because they, it, it's, it's, a, it's those emotions they, like, they come across. I did a book on tape, real. and by the way, I, I lost like, I've lost 10 pounds in the last two months, and I probably lost half of those because I'd go for a trail run, and I didn't want to stop listening, and I'd like nice. log four or five more miles. Nice. And so it's, I'm just telling people, it's a great book. Oh, it was a lot you. of fun. I couldn't put it down. I can't wait to read the next one. Awesome. Well, I brought you that copy, but, the galley copy today. So you get I'm to, psyched. You're the first person to, to get one, actually, because they just really? showed up this on Saturday. And I'm, after I leave here, I'm going to go and start sending them off to other authors for blurbs, to reviewers, that sort of thing. So awesome. you're, the, you're the first person to get one. I can't wait to dive in. It's going to be great. But that was a big, like, literally as I'm running, I'm, well, everybody knows what I'm talking about. I'm literally picturing Hillary Clinton's face on this character. Like, that's how my mind, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, 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 may or may not have been. <laughs> so, if somebody was going to play the protagonist role, do you have like who was in your mind? Like, so, so it's an interesting question because I can't, secret? I can't say because the person that I was thinking about is the actual person that that uh, optioned it for a movie. So, and I watch your Instagram. I've seen a few <laughs> comments from people, so I'm going to guess might, later. Might, but yeah, I'm not guess later. Yeah, I'm right. not supposed to. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to let them announce it. So, uh, right. But hopefully, it'll be announced soon. Pretty exciting. And, uh, yeah, yeah, amazing. It's. Uh, but the craziest part was that as I was writing, so they tell you not to think about somebody playing one of your characters in a book because, but. It's called demo love in the music industry. Oh, really? Okay. Because yeah. once you get used to like a certain sound and then you give it to a producer, it comes back different. Got it. You're like hurt. But it's I mean, just because you're yeah. so used to it being one way. 
I think so. But being a child of the '80s, like it was yeah. it was impossible for me not to do that. Right. And there was right. one person and one person only that I thought about playing the main role. And it's strange because he'd never done something that is this dark, um, you know, this visceral, this primal before. I hadn't done like military type stuff before. So it was almost odd that I thought of him in this role. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the only person I thought of. And then to have him be the first person to get a galley, copy of the first book, and to read it and reach out and want to option it was just crazy. It's, it's crazy how the world works. That's amazing. Yeah. How did he come to, to hear yeah, about it? So I, I don't know if I can tell the whole story because it'll probably give it away, but there was a, uh, a guy that was getting out of the SEAL teams, and um, he was probably at the 10-year mark at the time, and I heard he was a great guy, so I had him come to my office. It was when I was at that uh, training command at Buzz, and yeah. so I wasn't taking guys downrange anymore, and had him in my office and talked to him about transition, and Talked to, talked to him about uh, what he wanted to do, and then I introduced him to some people in the private sector that I, that I knew, and then that's, that's it. He went his way, he got out, and, and moved on. And then, I guess it's four years later, five years later, uh, I'm up at a shooting, shooting course in Oregon, and I get this call, and it's him. And he's like, hey, do you remember me? I'm like, of course I remember you. How's it going, man? Yeah, yeah. What's going on? Crazy to, crazy to reaching out. And uh, he's like, hey, man, I just wanted to reach out and Thank you so much for what you did as we got in the military. Nobody else helped me, hmm. um, and I really appreciate it. I was like, "Hey, of course, no problem." I love that's I I love doing that. I love seeing good guys, you know, succeed in the military or out. Uh, that's it. You know, that's just like how I would who I am, I guess. Right. But uh, he's like, "Hey, well, thank you." I'm like, "Hey, no problem." And he said, "Well, I heard you wrote a book. Somebody told me you have a book coming out." And I said, "Yeah, I have a book, book coming out. It comes out in a few months, and you know, these galley copy things are out now." And I, you know, I just can send you one if you want. And uh, he's like, yeah, well, I'd really like to give one to my friend of mine. I was like, well, who's your friend? And his friend. This person? Is the person, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. That's when you know you're on the right path. Crazy. So just too many things happened. That, right. Uh, yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, Will that be can... announced in the near future, or is I it kind so. of I unknown? Think, I think so. I think it's getting close, but we'll see. Wow. Yeah. That's I mean, things can always derail. You know, it's Hollywood. Things can derail the morning of shooting or whatever. So uh, keeping my expectations very low. Uh, so what happens, I'm pleasantly surprised. Right. But, right. Uh, but it seems, things seem to be headed in, a, in the right direction. That's awesome, man. Um, so with the book, again, I don't want to give it away, but for somebody that doesn't know anything about it, how would you describe it? And can you tell a little bit of the story? Again, I'd rather have yeah. you do this than me, so I don't... Yeah. So the first one's called The Terminal List. Mm -hmm. And... Title came very quickly. What I did is I wrote about six or seven different ideas down and put them all on a table in front of me. And I picked the one that I thought really had the most, the best chance of getting published and noticed by by New York. And it was like uh, a double entendre to the name, which I thought was really cool. Exactly, too. <laughs> exactly. So that was by design. Yep. Uh, and so I so I picked that one, and uh, it was just the one that I thought would be the hardest hitting, the most visceral, the most primal. Um, and the one that would, would resonate with people right off the bat. So mm -hmm. I went all in on that one. And I wrote down on a little yellow sticky paper, revenge, and I put that on my computer. So if something, either a, a paragraph, a chapter, a, a sentence even didn't either directly or indirectly tie back to that theme of revenge, then it was out right away. And so by the time it got to New York, there was hardly any editing that was done. Um, and I thought, hey, once it gets to Simon and Schuster, like these are the professionals, and there's gonna be a ton of edits, and they're gonna really make it great, and uh, or at least better than I could. It came back with like three questions: Hey, would he really do this here? Would he really say this here? And one third one I can't really. Wow. And so I just changed those three little little things, and that was it. Like, yeah, crazy. That's amazing. Yeah, crazy. So then, um, do you send it off to the DOD or whoever it is to? I did it before. That's before. Yeah. So okay. I give it to attorneys just because of all, we, like we talked about, all those other books that have been out there yep. um, and all the controversy about getting books approved by the military. Not Even though this was fiction, my lawyers said, hey, uh, if you interpret this regulation conservatively, uh, it means anything for public release. And they've since changed that regulation. They changed hmm. it in uh, the spring of 2017. Um, so I'm, I don't think I'm going to submit again for fiction because they did change it. But when my lawyers looked at it, it was summer of 2016. And so I submitted it to DOD before I gave it to, to Simon & Schuster just to make sure there was nothing in there that would be sensitive um, or anybody would have a, a problem with. But, so my experience with the DOD is they move really slow. When we everything we were doing... How long did it take to get that back? Well, I can't imagine them reading a book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So first you have to pay for your lawyers to read it. Right. Um, and then you send it to the DOD and it just goes in Months? a pile at someone's desk. So they advertise 30 days. So oh, better that, than I thought. Well, that's what they advertise. The first one came back in 45. 
I thought, that's pretty good. That's not bad for the government. I right. expected it to be a little longer, and okay, fine. They took out nine sentences. What they took out was, I mean, it's definitely not secret in any way, but, you know, it's going down to the lowest level first, and then you mm-hmm. can appeal. And then they say the appeal can take up to a year. And I decided not to appeal because I was paying these attorneys at the time. And right, I, right. It's like, hey, they took out nine sentences. Ah, it doesn't really affect the flow of the story, so I won't, I won't appeal it. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, 30 days, it's going to take a month and a half, two months, three at the latest for my second novel. Submit the second novel. Okay, almost seven months. So the second one was supposed to come out on April 2nd, but instead it's coming out July 30th because we missed our deadlines because uh, wow. the DOD took so long with their review, seven months. So I guess they're not big readers over there, not big fans of the genre. Um, they, they, maybe they could find a group of people that love reading this stuff, you know, no tear through it like right. everybody else did. But uh, it took, yeah, seven seven months for the, for the second one. So um, yeah, that, that slowed us down a bit, but that's how it goes. So the process of making, like, did you just start writing and then you find an agent or how does that flow? I mean, I guess yeah. given your background, it's probably gets you to the top of some lists where people are like, oh, this is interesting. It's hot right now. Well, so I didn't do it the way, like if I was to have studied it mm-hmm. and had kind of learned the regular way to do it or the normal way to do it or what you're supposed to do, yeah. uh, I'd probably not be published today. Uh, but I didn't know any of that, so I, didn't, I knew nothing. So I've been so focused on the team for so long, so focused on the mission. All I knew was I wanted to write a great book, and then what do you do from there? I didn't know, you need an agent? What? I yeah. had no idea. Right. Um, so I got really lucky, very, very lucky. Um, as I was writing, I think I was four months into it, um, a friend calls me and says, hey, uh, so-and-so told me you're writing a, writing a book, and I kind of kept it on the down low because I was still in the military at the time. I was, once you say you're getting out of the military, your whole job becomes to get out mm. administratively. So all your medical stuff and your dental stuff and transition programs and this, and you're, you're, you're not really, you're not taking guys down range anymore. And so you don't really have a, a job. Your job is to get out of the military. So I started, started writing. Um, so a friend calls and says, Hey, do you want to meet this guy or talk to this guy named Brad Thor? Do you know who that is? I'm like, yeah, I know who that is. So he's a guy essentially at the, one of the top guys in the, the thriller genre. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I said, I'd love to talk to him when he talked to me. I didn't know anyone in publishing, didn't know anybody, didn't know any other authors. You know, I've just read this stuff growing up and I, I essentially gave myself an education in writing thrillers because of all the guys I read growing up. Malcolm sure. Mill, uh, David Morrell, AJ Quinnell, JC Pollock, Tom Clancy, Stephen Hunter, all these guys. Um, and I said, yeah, I'd love to talk to him. So my friend set up a call and I talked to Brad Thor for like 30 minutes, maybe 45, and he was awesome. Could not have been nicer. Uh, he gave me a couple pieces of advice, um, but the main thing that he said is, he said, hey, your friend told me some things you did in the SEAL teams, and as a thank you for that, if you finish a book, I will let my publisher know that it's coming. I can't guarantee they'll open the package, can't guarantee they'll read it, definitely can't guarantee that they'll like it, but right. as, a, as a thank you, I will, I will let them know it's coming. I was like, whoa, that's all I need. That's Shut the it. door. Exactly. That's it. And he said, when are you going to be done? I said, a year from today. Um, and so I didn't talk to him for a year. He also said, hey... Pretty much don't call me <laughs> for you. Don't ask for advice. I don't want to read anything of yours and give you advice on it. You're like, just don't don't call me until it's until it's done. Uh, and I was like, hey, that, great. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. But uh, but he gave me some other advice too. Uh, he said, like, write it for your bedside table. Like, don't write it for, for anybody else. Write it, mm-hmm. write it for you. Um, and he said, the only difference between a published author and an unpublished author is that the published author never quit. And I was like, okay, well, I can do that. That's, but that's everything, yeah. right? Yeah. That's like exactly. an entrepreneurial that's business. Yeah. That's exactly a that's marathon life in general. Yeah. Getting back up when you, when you, when you fall down or get knocked down and keep moving forward. So, um, so that was great advice. Yeah. But, uh, so I called him back a year to the day and said, Hey, it's done. And he said, well, is it done or is it, are you finished or have you, is it the best that you can possibly make it? And I said, well, it's done. Uh, and he said, well, hey, take some time, read it, edit it, get it the best that you can possibly make it mm-hmm. and then we'll send it to New York uh, I was like wow awesome so during that time that's when I sent it to the DOD got the got the review um, they blacked out those lines and I kept reading and editing and tweaking it and tweaking it until I got it to as best as I could possibly get it and then called him back and said all right it's uh, it's as good as I can make this thing and he said okay I'll let New York know it's coming so sent it off to Simon and & Schuster and the, the one person that you would probably want to read a book like this and like it in New York did so and uh, the next thing you know, I'm in a couple weeks later, I'm in New York having coffee with Emily Bessler, who's Emily Bessler Books, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster and Atria. And 
uh, Brad Thor's publisher, Vince Flynn's publisher. He passed away a few few years ago. But uh, she is absolutely incredible and a cool. great conversation. I think she just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. Uh, she said, hey, I want, I want to publish this thing. And I said, well, great, let's do it. And she <laughs> goes, well, you need an agent. And I was like, well, how do you get one of those? Right. And uh, she's like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to four people and uh, you pick which one that, that you like the best and, and we'll go from there. So I uh, interviewed four and, and uh, chose one and next thing you know, doing the deal. That's amazing. So now, now that you're in, do they, is it like a, like, so I was a musician for 10 years. I mean, do, do they sign you to a record deal, like a book deal? And now it's like, oh, now I got to get three more out. Or do you have to kind of start at the bottom every time? Or how does, like, your foot's in the door, but yeah. how much does that mean? Yeah, so it's, uh, they're going to look at performance of your first book. That's going to be very important, of course. I, mm -hmm. I think this is all me just kind of, I'd assume, I'm yeah. very new to right. all of this. But uh, it was a two book deal for the first one. And then before the second deal happens, they have some metrics now. So they see how the first hardback sold. Um, I forget if we did the deal before the, the paperback came out, but regardless, anyway, they have some metrics and they can see how people responded to it. They can look at reviews, they can see trends, they can do all that stuff. So that's gonna affect whether there is a second deal or not. So right. in this case, yes, yeah, second deal for, for two more books. So it's a four total time. of four, yep, a total of four. Second one comes out July 30th, True Believer, and working on the third one right now, which I'm super excited about. Um, are they all part of the same series or the next two like a different story? No, it's a continuation. So it's going to give uh, too much away from the first book, but right. uh, yeah, it makes sense to continue on with the, with the same character protagonist. People uh, really enjoy reading about him. I want to find out what happens next and I want to keep writing about him and, and write about his journey. So uh, yeah, uh, second one comes out this summer and then the next one should come out the, either the spring or the summer after that, depending on the, the you know, the DOD reviews and all that sort of thing. So we shall see, but uh, four, right. book, four books coming, uh, coming down the pike. That's amazing. Our dogs are attacking the UPS man right now. Oh, nice. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Tucker, you're going to make sure they Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. This poor guy. Mine's pretty little. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, now there's point. two of them up here. Mine's still growing. Um, that's just, that's, that's so fun. I mean, that's, uh, you just get, you get to live in Park City and write and do what you love. It's like a reward for a life well lived, kind of from my perspective. I feel very, uh, very fortunate, that's for sure. And without Brad Thor, I, I, I thank him every chance I get because uh, I would not be where I am today without him opening that door for me. Right. Uh, and he'll say, hey, he cracked it or he breached it and then I kicked it in. But, uh, but yeah, I, I can never, I'll never be able to thank him enough for what he did for me. So as a, as a former SEAL that's writing books, living in Park City, I mean, you probably, do you wake up and nine to five, you work on a book? What do you do to, oh, outside of that, living here? Well, it, well, outside, well, it's chaos, first of all, as you know, with our, with our family, with uh, three kiddos and, and dog and, and all right. the rest of it, it's complete insanity uh, at all times. So uh, it's, uh, you know, we love living up here. So we hit the mountain, of course, we do the backcountry stuff. The, the, the kids are into all the skiing and rock climbing and all that sort of thing. So uh, we do travel a lot for, uh, for the hunting and, uh, and try to research for the book, that sort of thing. So we do get out and about quite a bit. And then the schedule is just, just crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. it's been the reception to the first novel was uh, such that it's kept me on the road quite a bit. So I listen to Howard Stern a lot. He just released a book. And all he complains about now is this book tour he has to do. If you know Howard Stern, he's, not gonna complain. he likes to complain. But um, how intense is that? Are you on a plane once a week? And is it book signings? Is it bookstores? Like, what does it look like? Yeah, so it's crazy. So usually, so I think authors usually do uh, a week or two of a book tour, and then they go back to, to writing. Um, in this case, with the debut novel, uh, I think it's been a little unusual is that it's, it's continued its its progression really since day one. So it's ramping so up. So it's it's yeah, it's crazy crazy. I mean I just uh, you know I guess I didn't really think about what to expect. I'm like of course it'll be a of course it'll do this is just normal. But I, I don't know if it is. Um, mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of a lot of requests. I do a lot of uh, get a lot of private events, sign books at, at those uh, book festivals, book fairs, uh, doing content. Uh, people want to follow along and see kind of. You know, kind of what I'm doing and, and how that fits into the book and all that. So, yep. uh, so I'm learning about social media, learning about branding, learning about co-branding, uh, and it's really an entrepreneurial type events where I thought it was just the writing, and then kind of you know the other stuff. I didn't really think about that at all. Right. But it's all you know part of getting getting out there, and and I really feel fortunate, and I feel like I 
need to say thank you to everybody that's made this a success because the readers and the word of mouth is really what's made it a success. People mm -hmm. read it, they tell a friend about it because I didn't have a background. No one knew who I was. I'd never been on social media. Didn't do anything in politics or in sports or anything like that. Didn't do anything special. Um, so when people tell others about the book and then they tell a friend, uh, so when I go to a signing and people come up and I get to talk to them, I really sincerely want to thank them for taking the time to come see me and for, for enjoying the novel and for telling a friend about it. So I, I really don't say no to, to options and opportunities like that. Eventually I might have to, but at this stage it's a full on, full on sprint and I really feel like I, I need to and I want to, to thank everybody for making this thing a success. It sounds so similar to what we're doing here because you can work your butt off and you can have a great idea, but it really takes a ton of people helping yeah. or making connections or posting about it on social or whatever it is. It's, there's just no way around it. You can't do it in a vacuum. Yep. No, exactly. Some of the best books ever written are probably sitting in somebody's nightstand or uh, on someone's hard drive right. just because they haven't been able to figure out how to get it to an agent or don't know how or the door wasn't open for them uh, or they don't do any of, the, of that, that marketing. They don't build a, build a brand or they haven't done something that would catapult them and be able to get the book out there. So there's probably some great novels that are sitting on people's nightstands. Well, I, I always relate it back to music because that's what I know, but you walk into a bookstore and it's like, how do you stand out? I mean, yeah. how, okay, I'm going to go buy a book to read. Right. I'm going on a trip or maybe right. two books. A lot of recommendations. Like, like, a million yeah. books in that store, literally. Right. And for me, just I think of my experience, someone tells me, hey, well, for me, I've you know, read all these guys growing up. So there's people that I, if a book comes out from them, I'm already on that train and I'm buying mm -hmm. it no matter what. Um, but as a new author, debut author, it's all about that word of mouth and somebody saying, hey, have you checked out this Jack Carr book? It's this new thing, blah, 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 former Navy SEAL. And right. you know, that, that helps a lot sure. um, because I'm bringing that personal experience to it. I'm not interviewing somebody and then writing about what I think it would feel like to do these things. It's me exploring my own emotions and my own experience uh, on the pages of a fictional thriller. So mm -hmm. I'm just taking those and applying them to a fictional narrative. Um, but it's all, it's all about those readers and that word of mouth. Well, and back to the book itself. I mean, you're wearing a Sitka hat and a shirt here. I, mean, that was one yeah, of the brands. I didn't know that we were going to be on video. No, no, it's all good. I mean, we, uh, we've got a lot of, you know, crossover there too with those guys. Um, you tie in a lot of brands. You're very specific about scopes and rifles yeah. and without giving too much away. Yeah. Um, why did you choose to do that? Like for me personally... I think I can just say like part of the book is in Jackson Hole and you, you name yeah, some yeah. places and some gear and it's like I could picture it because I've spent a lot of time there. Is that why you do that? Just because I, I would assume that most people haven't experienced those things. Right. But is that is that a technique you learn somewhere or what, what's the decision there? No, it was just that I've been a gear guy my whole life growing mm -hmm. up and backpacking and doing what else I've did growing up. I was always wanting to say, well, there's, new, there's a lighter piece of gear out there, there's something better, or there's a new boot out or whatever. Right. So growing up, I was just always a gear guy. And then going into the SEAL teams and being able to explore the military side of gear and bring things over from private sector into, uh, into our loadouts mm -hmm. was, I mean, it was, it was heaven. It's a great place for a gear guy to go because you always want to maximize all your advantages against the enemy. So if there's something out there that can, lets you do it faster um, or better than you were doing it before with a previous piece of gear, then let's give it a shot. Let's try that out. Um, so it was just very natural for me. It wasn't a decision that I made. Um, it was just just how it went. It was mm -hmm. very natural for me to talk about the, the products that I use uh, and that I use downrange that I continue to use today or new stuff that I, that I use today. And uh, that was just, that's just who I am. Um, so yeah, I so saw a couple, even, even people that don't like that, I think helps also because there's a couple, you know, I skim a couple of reviews here and there. I don't spend too much time looking at it, but if someone says, oh, you know, why does he say Solomon boot? Couldn't he just say boot? Well, to the gear guy, now that's a good review. Right. If someone's totally. complaining about it, it's like, I'm trying to figure out how we get on shut that supply so. products into your third book. <laughs> that's it. It's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll write a check. I, I don't know. Use it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's the other part of it. Like, I don't do, like, some people have reached out for endorsements and that yeah. sort of thing. And I, I did make a decision not to do any of those. Smart. Um, because I, want, I just like using what I use. What you I like talking about what I like and I don't want to feel beholden to, to anybody to have to put something in there. Um, and maybe there's a company that, uh, you know, sends a, sends a gun or something because I mentioned, okay, wonderful, but I didn't mention it because of that. Right. And then there's companies out there that don't send anything. They're, most of them don't send anything. Right. Um, but it's the stuff that I like to use and that I trust my life with uh, when I was in the teams. And now I trust 
my life and my family's lives to it when we go into the backcountry, um, and people can trust it. So really in the SEAL teams, it's uh, leadership is all about trust, mm-hmm. uh, both of, below you in the chain of command with your guys and above you also so that they give you the freedom of maneuver to do what you need to do on the battlefield without, um, uh, without micromanaging. So all about trust at all levels. Uh, so today, I think it's the same thing. So when someone reads something that I put on social media now or that I write about in the book, they can trust that it's not because some company wrote a check right. or, or gave me something free. It's because I really use that product. Uh, I really uh, trust trust that product. Um, so I'm going to keep that going. I think that's part of the, I don't know, the quote unquote brand. I'm learning I'm learning new technology now. No, I love it. Time, I love but, it. And we're going to uh, talk about this because I'll get some <laughs> stuff. No. Um, but the funny thing, the, the part two to that was the other side, like the call it the villains in the book and some of the products you put them in oh yeah it, it kind of made me laugh because like i've got a thing where like there's a couple cars out there where every time i see one i immediately think i know who that person is in the vehicle and <laughs> oh, it's yeah. not probably favorable right, right? so some yeah. of the pics you had there yeah. i was like that's funny like like cars can be characters too as can planes you know inanimate objects can almost be characters in a novel and i think personifies being a yeah being a child of the 80s what did, what do we have growing up you know the the fall guy truck the a-team van the magnum ferrari you know right. you had all these characters in tv shows that were essentially vehicles uh so the protagonist in this book has a my car which is a 88 land cruiser i just love land cruisers you love land cruisers whole, yeah i love the whole culture behind land cruisers uh you know see them overseas obviously we use the hilux extensively which you can't get here in this country unfortunately but uh love the old 80 style land cruisers so mm-hmm. um so that was essentially became a character in the book and the one i'm writing now becomes even more of a character in uh, in book three and the actual one that i have that's getting refurbished by the icon guys in la um that exact no nice. you're getting an icon one, well, it's, it's a it's a refurbished, you know, re, a, a build from them on my old car. Amazing. Um, but it's essentially becomes a character in book three that I'm writing right now with the same engine and the whole the whole deal. Um, so yeah, and the bad guys too. So I can put the bad guys in cars that give uh, an impression. It's a first impression. You see somebody drive up in something, it tells you a little bit about them. Totally. So uh, so I use those, uh, and that's that's very deliberate. It's funny because um, we even see it on our side. We. You know, we're a small team here. We, we end up being the models and our cars be the models. If we're, we have one device that actually charges cars. And we shot a video with um, one of our guys who's here. He had, a, he had a Land Cruiser. And all the comments were about the Land Cruiser, nice. not the product. Yeah, there's some people out there that are big into that. And what I use, and of course I love Land Rovers as well, but, uh, but my car is a Land Cruiser, I just, for whatever reason. But uh, I use those both as character development tools yep. in book three. One character is a Land Rover guy. James Reese, the protagonist, is a Land Cruiser guy, and same thing. They talk about like 45 versus 9 mil, uh, leather versus Kydex. So yep, those things yep. are all character development tools yep. for me because they're things that, that I know and can relate to. That's cool, man. That's cool. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, anything else we should cover that you want people to know? Yeah. Well, I guess I never gave the background of the whole book, but that's okay. They, they, got, they got the general well, gist give us, from... Give, uh, give, it, give it us. I'll definitely got, put it in the notes and stuff, but yeah, tell they us... They the general gist. Tell it's us a, the background. Uh, so a little bit of background is it's a story of revenge without constraint, and it's a story of a guy who has a background similar to mine in that he was a prior enlisted SEAL sniper, becomes an officer, and he's at that point in his time in the military where it's time to get out and take care of his family. So he's made the decision that he's, after this next deployment, he's coming home and he's getting out. Uh, and of course that's when disaster strikes, both downrange out on the home front, and he becomes the unwitting pawn as part of a government conspiracy to test drugs on our nation's most elite soldiers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's happened before. So some of the things that came out of the church hearings in the 70s that um, brought to light experiments that the CIA did with um, mental patients, uh, with soldiers, uh, university students, um, that sort of thing came to, came to light back then. So I thought, what if someone didn't get the memo that's not allowed anymore? What if enough time has passed right. where someone right. gives that another shot um, and tries to wrap it into to, uh, to PTSD beta blockers and doing it for the country and that sort of thing? What would that look like today? Uh, and I needed my character to also not just have nothing left to lose, quote unquote, but to be dying. And that comes from me studying, uh, I've been studying warfare my entire life. And so in Japanese Bushudo, the samurai would go into battle thinking they were already dead because they thought that made them more effective and efficient warriors. Wow. And I thought, how do we bring that into a, a modern context and make that part of the story? And that's where the, the testing drugs on our nation's soldiers and the side effects to those that need to be covered up by both the government and private industry come to light. And then, of course, our character starts to unravel that conspiracy and build out a list and then starts working his way to the top of that list using the things that had worked against us in Iraq and Afghanistan 
here on home soil. It's a little Jason Bourne, right? Kind a little of Jason a... Bourne in there. There's uh, probably, you know, I'm the, I am, uh, everything I've read and everything that I've watched uh, is part of who I am today. Sure, sure. Uh, all the study that I've done on insurgencies and terrorism, uh, my experience from, from downrange, uh, all that stuff is, is who I am today. So right. all of that ends up in the pages. Of the I mean, when I was reading slash listening to it, I wanted to know which which parts were like veiled uh, reveals of actually what's happening. You know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> there's I, a few I, of those in I, there. I've been like, and again, I'm a rodeo clown, not a not a cowboy. Like I was playing music over in Iraq, but like I've had enough conversations with people over there to realize that there are millions of layers to things, and there are underlying missions and perspectives and movements to do different things. And so that's when I hear this stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, this kind of reassures what I have learned. And I just want to know more. Like, there's stuff I'll never know, but... Me too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you get X amount of information. But do you, when you're over, I mean, let me ask you this. When you're watching the news over here and seeing that society react a certain way, is that really frustrating given that you know multitudes more than what they do and you know what's actually happening so it's not that i know anymore it's that i uh assume or i know that there's probably more to it mm -hmm. uh so mm -hmm. i wouldn't say it's it's frustrating it's just a more of an acceptance of uh well the news for some reason chose to focus on this particular incident or right. this particular campaign and to show it in a certain light um, but there's a lot more to it than that having been involved in a, a few things where a sliver has been shown on the news and there's a lot more. It's like the iceberg, right? There's a lot more underwater. Um, and so being able to explore some of that in a, uh, in a fictional way um, is, uh, is a lot of fun and very therapeutic. For it me. was a lot of fun. It made me want to believe that that's what was going on. And there's guys out there trying to right the ship. I mean, it was, that's fun. That's awesome. fun to think about, right? Yeah, that's why I love doing what I'm doing. I feel so fortunate to, to be living this dream post-military. Yeah. So besides book writing out here in Park City, what, what do you get into? Well, mostly juggling kids. Yeah. Juggling the kids, juggling kids training right. the dogs. Like that's the, uh, that's the focus. That's, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's my next mission in life is making sure that our, our kids are, uh, are uh, you know, raised with me around. And I'm actually present in there uh, and part of their lives and helping them become good people and good citizens, hopefully. Um, and we'll, we'll, we won't know if any of that worked out until we look back you know, 20, 30 years from now and see how they, they turned out. But um, yeah, being here for them is really... The, the next mission in life for us and that's uh, that's why we're here that's awesome um i think that's often overlooked and hyper needed this day and age yeah. i mean it just seems like so many kids are being babysat by ipads and the kardashians <laughs> so don't get me wrong earlier. it's a challenge to compete with that ipad right. uh you know we fall into that trap just like just like everybody else and we we're certainly aware of it mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah being here and being being present and being with them and being able to explore all this is this beautiful backcountry with them is uh, is why we're here. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. I think that's going to be really interesting to a lot of people and awesome. appreciate it. I can't wait to dive into the second book. I'm honored. I really got the first copy. That's crazy. You got the first one. First one out of the box. Oh, my god! I gave one to my wife, so you're the first. Oh, not okay. Well, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but no, thank you so much for having me Thanks on. Thanks for coming it's on, man. We got to hang out more. And, uh, yeah, um, we'll do it. It was awesome. awesome. Thanks, dude. Thank All you. Right. Take care.